Today we're going to be completing a first species exercise with the cantus firmus in the bass. As always, we want to sing the cantus firmus first before jumping into the realization. Do, fa, mi, la, re, so, fa, mi, re, do. Next, I always try to fill in the last two measures if their solution is obvious, which isn't always the case. In this case, however, we have scale degree two going to one in the lower part, and this very often demands having scale degree seven going to one in the upper part. After making these preliminary preparations, I often ask myself a question. And that question is, where can I create a beautiful, interesting moment? Asking this question or questions like this are important because they immediately force us to start thinking musically. Oftentimes we get so caught up with the idea of completing an exercise and following the rules that we end up writing something that sounds uninspired. So what does it actually mean to write a beautiful moment? For me, a beautiful moment is one that has both harmonic and melodic interest. Perhaps there is some sort of dissonance involved harmonically or a tasteful leap is used to arrive at some sort of climax. Things like this. Take a look at the cantus firmus and notice how we begin with an overall ascent followed by a descent to the cadence in stepwise motion. I think it's safe to say that since the descent begins with G, G marks the beginning of our falling action into the resolution. In other words, G marks the beginning of a relaxation as opposed to a building of tension created by the initial ascent. This means that our climax will likely, it doesn't have to, but will likely occur pretty close to this G, around one to two measures before it. So which one of these measures should we choose to place our climactic point? Well, there's a general principle that you could and should follow whenever possible. The climax often occurs over some sort of subdominant area, so scale degrees two or four will be involved. And what do you know? We have a scale degree two in the lower part right before our descent. So why the subdominant during a climax? If we think about the natural tendencies of subdominant scale degrees two and four, both of these degrees very often, not always, but very often, have a natural tendency to resolve downward. And what happens after we reach a climax? We descend downwards. With that being said, let's try an F in the upper part for our climax. We choose F instead of D because D would create an octave, which can pose problems and also sounds a bit hollow. Having a hollow sound isn't exactly something we would want during a climax. So here's our F, and notice how you can easily imagine some sort of ascent up to this F, followed by a descent to our eventual cadence. Now that we've chosen our climax, I like to ask myself, how can I make this arrival satisfying? If you haven't already, I recommend watching my first counterpoint video on exploiting dissonance before moving on here. Otherwise, what I'm about to discuss may confuse you. Back to our climax. We have an F against a D. What would be a nice dissonance to imply over this DF dyad? In general, targeting sevenths above the bass is almost always a good idea. So let's go with C. Let's take a step back and look at the bar before our climax. Can C be harmonized against this A? Yes, it's a third. So everything checks out. What does this all imply? When C leaps up to the F, the C lingers in our ears into the next bar, giving us a slight impression of a D minor seventh chord, a dissonant chord. This is a clever way we can exploit dissonance and create harmonic interest in one-to-one -one textures. Bach does it quite often. Conveniently, by creating this moment of harmonic interest, we have by consequence also created a moment of melodic interest the leap to our high point is satisfying because the sudden gathering of energy makes us really, really want to release all that energy. It sets up our descent perfectly. Furthermore, we move in contrary motion with the lower part, which is always good. What would happen if we had put another note instead of the C though, say an E? I mean, E creates a consonance of a perfect fifth with the A, so it's perfectly acceptable, at least according to contrapunto code. But let's listen closely to this. 
Notice how much drier this sounds when compared to our C. The C, at least in my opinion, sounds a bit warmer, tender even. This brings me to an important point. Just because something follows the rules does not necessarily mean it'll sound good. And if it doesn't sound good, then I personally consider it wrong. I really believe it's important to not only follow the rules, but to always strive to create musically satisfying lines and ideas while applying said rules. Moving on, how can we approach this C? Well, oftentimes the path of least resistance is best. And in music, such a path usually involves stepwise motion. Since this line as a whole should be ascending to the F, let's see if we can simply ascend by step to the C. To do this, we work backwards from the C and descend by step. That leaves us with a B, which creates a fifth, an A, which gives us a third, and a G, which debuts our counterline with a fifth above the Cantus Firmus. Now that we've set up our climax, how do we leave it? I think a lot of people would be tempted to take the path of least resistance again. That would look a little something like this. Stepwise motion that resolves downward to our cadence. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it? But there's something wrong with it. Let's take a listen. Notice how the last four measures create four consecutive parallel sixths. We really don't want to have more than three consecutive imperfect intervals in a row. The reason being, when we have four or more of the same interval, we lose the independence of voices. The voices start to feel as one harmonized unit, as opposed to two separate entities that work together harmoniously. This lack of independence becomes especially evident when using longer note values like we do in first species exercises. Furthermore, it just becomes too predictable to the ear. Luckily, to fix this, we need only change one of the notes so that a new harmonic interval is introduced. We'll keep this D because it's nice to continue the descent by stepwise motion from the climax for as long as possible. If we keep this D, then we're obligated to change the note in the next bar above the E. What would be a good note to choose? Ask yourself if this is another area where we could potentially imply a dissonance. Over an E, D is a dissonant seventh, so if we were to leap away from this D, we could once again imply another dissonance. As a general rule, when you leap away from a note to imply a dissonance of a seventh, it's usually best to target the third above the note you were leaping to. Targeting the third is nice because it will imply some sort of seventh chord. In this case, the third above E is G. E and G together with a D give us an E minor seven sound. This leap from D to G is then balanced in the opposite direction with our B, which resolves to our cadence. Let's listen starting from bar seven. The D leaping down to G brings much more interest to the line when compared to when we had the descending stepwise motion into the cadence. Notice that we outline a G major triad with this DGB figure. This is how you want to outline triads in counterpoint. When outlining triads, we want to avoid outlining them in this manner. that is, chord tone by chord tone, because it prevents you from balancing your leaps with motion in the opposite direction. Instead, it's better to skip an adjacent chord tone, B in this case, and leap up to the next chord tone after. That chord tone then leaps downward to balance the leap and recover the skipped chord tone. Again, if we want to outline G major triad starting from, say, B, we immediately leap up to the G, skipping our neighboring chord tone D. That G then leaps downward to recover the skipped chord tone D. Let's listen to the final product.
Something to take away from this exercise is don't be afraid to leap. Oftentimes I see people say things like avoid leaps whenever possible in counterpoint. But this is very misleading. The rule really is your counterpoint should consist of mostly stepwise motion. You can have leaps, so long as they are treated carefully. This cantus firmus consists of 10 notes, and we only use 3 leaps. Everything else is stepwise motion. The cantus firmus itself has even more leaps than we used, 4. And if the cantus firmus has leaps, as far as I'm concerned, we can definitely use leaps. Furthermore, there's really nothing more boring than a counterline that noodles by step around the scale. Tasteful leaps bring harmonic and melodic interest to the line. It's also important to be thinking and hearing over longer stretches of time. For example, this D ultimately resolves to this C by step. The leaps in between may seem a bit jagged to the eye, but to the ear the line as a whole actually sounds quite natural. Don't forget to always see with your ears and hear with your eyes. Thanks for tuning in. In our next video, I'll correct exercises I collected from some Redditors over this Cantus Firmus to highlight different errors that can occur. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you're notified when I put a new video up. See you soon!